This is a short video to cover one more topic that is related to solutions in chemistry, and that is of colligative properties. So when you have a solute dissolving in a solvent, you actually have particles of that solute going into solution. And those individual particles can give that solution certain physical properties. For example, a property known as electroconductivity, or the ability to conduct electricity, depends on the type of particle that is dissolved in the solution. So if you have an ionic solution, if you have a chemical that's been made up of a metal and a nonmetal, which makes an ionic compound, if that's your solute, when it dissolves in the solvent, it is going to go and ahead and conduct electricity. That's why you're told to get out of the pool if there is a thunder and lightning storm coming. The lightning would be conducted by the water in the pool because it has some ionic chemicals in it. Covalent or molecular solutions do not conduct electricity. So if you had a solution of salt water, which is an ionic compound, and a solution of sugar water, which is a covalent or molecular compound, you could send electricity through the salt water, but not through the sugar water. Freezing points and boiling points are two other properties that depend on the number of particles not the type, but the number of particles found in the solution. So concentrated solutions are different than more dilute solutions. Concentrated solutions have a lower freezing point and a higher boiling point than dilute solutions. And these freezing and boiling points, or situations where the number of particles is what changes the property, are known as colligative properties. So what is a freezing point? Well, that's the temperature where the change occurs between liquid and solid. We call these states of matter, solid, liquid, and gases, phases. So we have a phase change. We're having a change from one phase to another. So when something starts off as a liquid and turns into a solid, the temperature it is when that happened is known as the freezing point. If you have freezing point depression, the freezing point has gone down. And that is the difference in the temperature between what you would get as a freezing point of the pure solvent and then the new freezing point with the solution. So when you add solute into the solvent to make a solution, you're adding particles. So on this graph, the pure solvent is this first line. And so here we have a freezing point. We're tracking temperature over time. And this is the point where it has chilled and then it sort of stabilizes and that tells you that the substance is freezing. So that's the freezing point. But when you make a solution, your freezing point changes. And so it ends up over here. And if this is your temperature, you see the temperature is lower than the temperature we had for the pure solvent. So freezing points go down when you make a solution. This little cartoon, you know, tells you that friends keep you from freezing by snuggling up. <coughs> Excuse me. So by having all those particles in there, it keeps the solution from freezing as quickly as it would if it was just the solvent. The opposite is true when you have a boiling point, which is where the, te the temperature at which you have this phase change between liquid and gas. So we're going from liquid to gas when you're talking about a boiling point. When there are particles in solution, the boiling point goes up, and we call that boiling point elevation. The difference in temperature between what the boiling point would be of the pure solvent compared to that of the solution. So here we're measuring vapor pressure on this graph. Um, on the left, and vapor pressure is showing that things are going into the gaseous state. They're producing a vapor, and as the vapor goes up, that means more molecules are going into the air, kind of like we see over here in this first diagram. This is an illustration of what's happening when something is boiling. Things that are liquid in this container are making a jump and becoming gas and heading into the atmosphere. So as more and more particles move into the atmosphere, the vapor pressure will go up. So on the graph, we see the vapor pressure of the, um, when it reaches the point that it's the same as the atmosphere, which is one atmosphere, 
that's where you get the switch over from liquid to gas when it can move into the atmosphere when it matches vapor pressure with the atmosphere. So our solvent by itself has a vapor pressure point or boiling point right here at this temperature, at this first temperature. But when we have solution, by the time it gets to this same amount of vapor pressure where the particles can make the jump into the gas state, we again have a higher temperature, so it's different. The boiling point has gone up when you've added the particles. So the picture over here is showing that maybe the particles are, are on this, the second beaker, the particles somehow are getting in the way <clears throat> and not letting the solvent particles do the trick of making a, the jump from a liquid into a gas. This is also what happens when we talk about evaporation, that particles are turning from liquid into gas. So we use colligative properties all the time. You're familiar probably with some of the effects. Like you know you put antifreeze in the radiator. Well it's there as an anti-freezing device. It's there to lower the freezing point of the solution that's in your radiator so that your radiator will not freeze when outdoor temperatures go. You don't want a big block of ice inside your engine. You want to have that cooling liquid, liquid be able to circulate around your engine. So you put in particles. You put in a solute, which we call antifreeze, to lower the freezing point. But it also raises the boiling point. So antifreeze also helps you in the summer by making that solution inside your radiator, inside your cooling system, take longer for it to want to turn into a gas. So antifreeze is not, all, not only a help in cold weather, but it's also a help in hot weather, and that is all about colligative properties. How about a small refrigerator? Well, if you've ever been in a, or maybe someday in life soon, you'll be living in an apartment with a small refrigerator, or you stayed in a hotel where there's been a small refrigerator, which has a freezer compartment, you may have discovered that the small freezers inside these small refrigerators can usually make ice, but they don't keep ice cream very hard. The ice cream kind of gets like soft serve because their temperature is right about at freezing, right about zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But the ice cream, which is water with a whole bunch of other stuff in it because it's made from milk, which is basically water, but it's got a bunch of protein and sugar and fat in it. And then you add more things to make your ice cream. So you're putting more particles in solution. And so it needs a, it has freezing point depression. It will take a lower temperature to make that ice cream freeze. So instead of freezing at zero degrees, most ice creams freeze at about negative three degrees Celsius, or that's comparing about from 32 degrees Fahrenheit to about 27 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's enough of a difference that if your freezer is at 32 or 31 or even 30 degrees Fahrenheit or just a little bit below zero Celsius, it's still not cold enough to freeze your ice cream because of colligative properties. Again, in cold weather, people put things called ice melts, um, which is really a salt, an ionic compound. Sometimes it's calcium chloride or it might be sodium acetate. And they put that on sidewalks or is spread on the roads by the highway department to keep ice from forming on those surfaces because the little bit of solid that will be on that surface will mix with water and create a solution. And it'll be a solution that is full of particles of the salt and that, will ex that solution will experience freezing point depression. Instead of freezing at, again, zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, <coughs> excuse me, generally they will freeze many, many degrees below zero. It depends on what kind of salt is being used, but I saw some figures for calcium chloride, which is one of the common ionic compounds used in these ice melt products. And the, that particular uh, substance, calcium chloride, would lower the freezing point to a negative 31 degrees Celsius. So well below zero, much colder than it ever gets here in South Carolina. Um, and again, it's all because of colligative properties. More particles there in that solution that is formed on the surface and it stays wet, but it won't freeze.
And then finally, one for the opposite direction. If you've ever made candy, um, you'd have to use a candy thermometer, and you are heating up this boiling syrup to temperatures that are well above the boiling point. I don't know the Celsius conversions for these, but um, candy, you typically are cooking it to 250 or maybe even close to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And in Fahrenheit, water will boil at 212 and so water, if you if you boil a pot of water, once it hits 212, it's going to stay at 212 until the water has all evaporated, and then your pot will heat up. But if you put some sugar in it, and there's quite a bit of sugar in when you're making candy, you're adding more particles, you are causing the boiling point to go up, it's experiencing boiling point elevation, and then you're going to create this syrup that can boil at very high temperatures, 280 degrees, maybe even 300 degrees, which is what you need to make a hard candy, like something like peanut brittle. So all of these are examples of colligative properties when the number of particles in a solution makes a difference for either how cold something has to be before it becomes solid or how hot something has to be before it turns into a gas. A final type of colligative property that's not related to freezing or boiling point is osmotic pressure. And this is something that's important in the medical field. It's all about how water moves across a membrane. And of course, our cells are all covered with membranes. If you remember from biology, we talked about osmosis, which is the type of diffusion that happens with water. And water will always move towards a higher concentration of solute. So it will move, water is the solvent, of course, so it'll move towards more particles. So if you are in the medical field and you want to put a solution into somebody's blood vessels because they need to have maybe a little bit of boost of sugar or, or a medication, you want it that the solute and the solvent are evenly balanced so that any water moving out of the cells, like in this very first box on the left, any water moving out of the cell will be compensated for by water moving back into the cell at the same rate. So there's no change. And that's known as an isotonic solution. And anything used medically is going to be an isotonic solution. But if something is put where there are fewer particles outside the cell than there is inside this, or I mean there's yeah, fewer outside than inside, so there's more solute inside, then water wants to move in, like we see in the second. And in that case, water will keep on moving in until the cells actually burst. Or if you take a bath and you soak for a long time, you notice your fingers get all wrinkly. Well, they're not getting wrinkly and shriveling up. They're actually swelling because water's moving into your skin cells. Because of the structures that hold your skin to your muscles and your underlying um, tissues there. There are some parts that can stretch and there are some parts that can't stretch. And the parts that stretch get fat and puffy and the parts that can't stretch make the wrinkles. So when you soak in the tub, you are actually in a hypotonic solution and water is moving into your finger cells until they almost can't hold it anymore. And then the final situation is when there is more solute outside of where the water is, and so the water moves towards that solute, like we see in this third picture. And that is why you don't want to drink seawater, or which is a water with lots of salt particles in it. Um, it will not keep you alive. It will eventually cause your cells to lose their own water as the water tries to balance itself across your body. So that's another type of colligative property. You can calculate how much things are going to move with some other math formulas, which we're not going to be doing in class. So you can be thankful another math you won't have to do. But I did want to make you aware of this because you do see colligative properties in everyday life, and it is part of chemistry and solutions.